good evening, everyone. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. We're just going to wait for folks to file on in from the waiting room, and we will get going in about 30 seconds. Uh, for those who are already in from the waiting room, uh, feel free in the chat. If you're comfortable doing so, no pressure, no obligation, but if you're comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, let Heather, Kim, and I know uh, where you're watching from, uh, if you're comfortable doing so. No obligation. And we'll get started in about 15 seconds. All right, wonderful. Welcome. Welcome, Margo. Welcome, Audrey. Excellent. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Stephen. Welcome, Deborah. Hello, Jean. Hello, Lynn. Always good to see you, Lynn. Hi, Jack. Hi, Gail. Hello, Carol. Hello, Rachel. I do apologize if I uh, missed anyone here. I can't quite see all the names. Hello, Diana. All right, great. Uh, hey, Patricia. Hey, Pat. And hey, Wayne. All right, well, we'll get started here. Hey, Kathy. Uh, so uh, we'll get started. A couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, I am recording tonight's presentation. Uh, we are in Zoom webinar mode, so uh, the camera, nor Heather Kim or I can see you or hear you. Uh, you're going to communicate with us uh, via the chat and via the Q&A. So if you have any comments, you can type them into the chat at any time. If you have any questions, you can type those into the Q&A at any time. And we will get to all comments and questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And uh, I will jump back on the call at that point and uh, read them to Kim and Heather. A uh, couple of other uh, quick things. I will be sending an email tomorrow morning to all registrants, everyone who's here with us live, uh, plus those who signed up but couldn't make it. And in that email will be a link to this recording. And it, there will also be a link to a very short feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 to 60 seconds, uh, fill out the survey, let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events at uh, all four of our libraries. So let's get to the good stuff here. Uh, tonight's presentation is entitled uh, 111 Places in Boston That You Must Not Miss. Uh, we're joined by um, authors Heather Kaplow and Kim uh, Winjica. And Kim, you can, uh, I apologize in advance here, you can, you can correct me as we go here, uh, for a presentation on their new book, 111 Places in Boston That You Must Not Miss. So Heather is one of the rarest kind of creatures you will find in Boston. She's a native Bostonian, a visual and performing artist as well as a writer. Heather travels frequently for projects in both spheres. Let me cancel that there. Uh, and has a very deep understanding of what it's like to be a newcomer in an unfamiliar city. It's among Heather's life goals to make Boston a more welcoming place as well as to throw spotlights on Boston's many nuanced subcultures. You can find anything you need in Boston, except maybe a parking space in the winter. If you seek it out, take it from a native. And Kim, meanwhile, fell in love with Boston while growing up in nearby Southern New Hampshire and has never become tired of the city's beauty and historic charm in the 12 years she's been living there since attending Emerson College. A full-time copywriter with experience in multiple industries, including travel, tech, and fashion. She has also written pieces for The Atlantic, New York Magazine, McSweeney's, and more. I uh, also want to uh, uh, mention that um, uh, Heather and Kim uh, are donating their time tonight, so we're extra appreciative of them. Uh, I do want to note that the entire Wednesday night virtual author series that we're running here at the Tewksbury Library is funded by the Corning Foundation, uh, which is um, uh, based um, uh, out of the uh, business, uh, the Corning uh, Life Sciences, which is based here in Tewksbury. Uh, and I also, uh, most importantly, want to thank um, all the partnering libraries for collaborating with us tonight. And they include the Memorial Hall Library in Andover, the Flint Memorial Library in North Reading and the Wilmington Memorial Library, and I guess that one's self-explanatory, uh, in Wilmington. Uh, and just to set expectations, I anticipate tonight's program uh, will last approximately an hour or so, 
uh, we may go a little long or a little short, but we'll end in the ballpark of eight o'clock. All right, so it's 7.05. Hopefully everyone who wants to be here is here. And let's give a big virtual round of applause to Heather and Kim. And ladies, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we can get started um, presenting. Can everyone see my screen? We can see it, Kim. <laughs> okay, I can see it. <laughs> All right, and unfortunately, Alyssa um, had a babysitter uh, issue at the last moment and will not be joining us tonight. Um, but as we, we kind of, uh, you know, had that introduction already, but I'm Kim Windica, I'm a co-author and uh, I'm a full-time copywriter, a freelance feature travel um, and a humor writer. And Heather, I don't know if you want to say a few words as well. Sure. I am Heather Kaplow. I'm a, um, I do writing and like arts and culture journalism and some copywriting, but not much. And uh, I'm also, I do uh, visual and performance art in the Boston area and beyond. And Alyssa is our photographer and is not here today, sadly. Yeah, but she is a wedding photographer primarily um, from Rhode Island, but um, I believe she went to the New England School of Photography. Um, and so I uh, had, you know, an interest in Boston and um, was able to, you know, go in and shoot all of the places there. Um, so, so uh, the bulk of the writing for this guidebook was actually done uh, during the peak of the pandemic, which uh, was a challenge to say the least. Um, one silver lining was that once people kind of got you know, settled into the new normal, um, you know, they were definitely more available and present to talk to us and, and kind of share stories with us um, and, you know, participate in the book, which was, was great. Yeah, I feel like we got a sort of almost like a insider's view into the experiences of all the organizations we were working with, because you know, they were thinking through when they were, we, we were asking them when they were going to reopen and they were thinking through it and telling us about what they were missing. So it was a very, um, really different experience than we probably would have had at another time working on this project. Definitely. And, you know, as um, if any of you have, have checked out the book, um, a lot of the chapters are focused on small businesses in the area um, and kind of off the beaten path places. And, you know, it's more important than ever right now to be supporting those, those businesses. So um, we're really happy with how it came out and, um, you know, the ability to, to be promoting those businesses in the book. But we should probably worth saying that like there was a lot of tension in creating this that I, don't, I think doesn't usually happen. I mean, there's always, this is for both of us a first book, for all of us, all three of us a first book. So there was sort of the anticipation and the unsureness of like what happens when you make a book that doesn't happen, what's supposed to happen. And then doing it in this environment where everything was completely up in the air. It was really a kind of like, you know, stop and go a lot. It was just a really unusual experience. But also I think it made the book, well, I don't know what you think, Kim, but I think it made the book richer because we richer were so and, appreciating it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Definitely, and definitely a memorable experience and one that felt really good to have. <laughs> it feels good to have it out in the world even more so I think than than otherwise. Um, okay, so we can get started by getting weird. Um, <laughs> there are lots of weird places in Boston and that was a main focus uh, for the book and finding kind of uh, strange or undiscovered spots. Um, so we've highlighted a handful here. Um, Heather, I don't know if there's any you wanna start by talking about or? Sure, um, I, I think it's probably worth saying that the um, the whole series is kind of focused in this way. It wasn't just us. This is like a, a big international series, and it's great to have Boston finally be a part of it because it's been around for a while. That's based in in Cologne, Germany, and um, and all of them have 111 places. This is the standard um, number for the whole series, and there is a real um, focus on the kind of quirky things that make a city um, special. So uh, we've you can sort of see here that there are like, uh, you know, numbers next to the titles here. And those are the chapter numbers. And we've sort of alternated in the book writing each chapter. So there'll be some here that I've written and some that Kim's written. And um, 
And I was thinking today about the Italian donkey. So maybe I'll tell the story of, of that little guy. <laughs> oh, my voice is soft. Let me see. My microphone might be hiding in my hair. Is that better? That's good. OK. Um, so the, um, the Italian donkey was a souvenir. Um, his last name is Webb, but let me see if I can remember his first name. Um, uh, it's better, even though I'm not talking. Um, Roger Webb <laughs> uh, went to Italy and was looking for a nice souvenir to bring back and fell in love with this bronze donkey, which was is not small, like it's a sizable bronze donkey. It, it was um, this was in the 90s and the value of the donkey was about the equivalent of $10,000 in Lira. And I know that, you know, we all tend to travel and bring things back for people that they sort of don't know what to do with. And in this case, he didn't bring it back for some family member. He decided to bring it back for the city of Boston as a souvenir of his travels. And the city of Boston was sort of like, we don't know what to do with a Italian bronze donkey. <laughs> um, so he kind of came up with this concept that the city uh, had always been run by Democrats, and it might be nice for um, Republicans to have a donkey to yell at, uh, so, you know, symbolizing the the Democratic Party. And so he had someone cast a pair of shoes that faced the donkey and you can stand in the shoes and yell at the donkey. Um, and it's now in front of the old state house in Boston. So it's a it's a cute statue. I think if you pass by it, kids climb on it. It's it's very charming to look at, but it has this very um, sweet and funny story behind it. So that's why we included it in the book. Yeah, I love that one. Um, and I think I'm in the mood to talk about the skull of Phineas Gage today, um, which some of you might have, have heard of, um, but I think uh, I'm going to read the chapter. It's pretty short um, and it's just kind of a really interesting story. So <clears throat> uh, the chapter is uh, chapter 99, the skull of Phineas Gage, and every chapter has a, a subheader that's kind of like a witty turn of phrase. Um, and so this one is a mind altering experience. The next time you complain about having a bad day, think of poor Phineas Gage, a railroad construction worker who endured the unfortunate experience of having an iron rod completely penetrate his skull, and he lived to tell the tale. While working on the Rutland and Burlington Railroad in Vermont, Gage was preparing to blast some rock, a process that involved sprinkling gunpowder into holes and tamping it down with said rod. Distracted by workers behind him, Gage turned his head. There's never been a verified account of what exactly happened to set it off, but the explosive powder ignited and sent the tamping iron hurtling through the foreman's cheekbone and through his skull. Shockingly, he never lost consciousness during the incident and was stable enough to stand up and settle into an ox cart for the trip into a nearby town. Reportedly, Gage joked with the doctor, here's business enough for you. Sadly, th things were never quite the same for Gage after that fateful day in 1848. Though he survived, the 27-year-old was rendered blind in his left eye, and his brain's frontal lobe was severely damaged, transforming his personality for the remaining 12 years of his life. Many reported that the once hardworking, responsible man became gross, profane, coarse, and vulgar. His friends described him, described the new Phineas as no longer Gage. Later, it's believed that his temperament began to even out and his social skills began to return. His fascinating story has been the subject of intense scrutiny in the medical community for decades, particularly in the field of neuroscience, the topic of cerebral localization and the influence of the brain on one's personality and behavior. The skull and the tamping iron came to Boston in, in 1868 when Gage's former doctor, John Martin Harlow, donated them to the Warren Anatomical Museum at the Countway Library. So, and I, I do believe, I think it was um, under construction for a while um, during the pandemic, but I do believe that the library is open again. So you can, you can go um, view the, the skull <laughs> and you can see the, a close up of it here with the, um, the hole from the, the iron rod. Yeah, I saw the question from Renee, I think, about um, showing the photos. We're, we're, so we have sort of this one photo here of one of the weird things on our list, but um, I guess we're sort of enticing you to get the book because uh, the book is really um, profoundly focused on the photography, actually. And I mean, this, it, every page has this huge colorful layout and then the text on the side. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you'll, you could find the golden donkey there. Yeah. Okay. 
Are there any other ones you want to talk about on this one, Heather? Or? Um, I could read. Well, maybe I'll talk about the taco bench since we I'll read the taco bench story because I'll just tell you about the taco bench because <laughs> <laughs> you can see it here. Uh, the taco bench is a is a piece of artwork by a Boston artist named Matthew Hinkman, Hintzman, actually. Um, and it is, uh, I can't really see it here, but it's sort of along a path um, on Jamaica Pond, which is a very lovely uh, place to spend the day in Jamaica Plain. You can boat, take walks, um, stroll around with baby carriages, which people normally do. And, um, and there's, you'll see a series of benches that go along this path. And um, one of them looks like this. And it's, this isn't like a Photoshop trick. It's, um, <laughs> It's, this is a little bit of, it, it, it really looks like this. So it's sort of a U-shaped bench. It's gotten a nickname from the community uh, as the taco bench. And its origin is that in 2006, um, Hintzman was, I guess, sort of being playful and either cast these himself or found parts and made this alternative bench um, to sort of make the other benches look boring, I guess. And uh, the city of Boston sort of noticed it. It was there for a long time and people used it and played with it. And then they found it, the, the city kind of pulled it out and they were, you know, it wasn't, they hadn't put it there and they didn't know where it came from. And he finally claimed it. And then it was so beloved that the community kind of had a little bit of an outcry for it. And the city agreed to let him put it back in, but they had to kind of approve the way that it was mounted and all that. So it's back and um, it's really fun to go take pictures of yourself. People find their kids climb in it. You can find it's a nice place to take a nap on a sunny day. Um, but you know, that's the story of it is that it's public art that was first forbidden and then approved uh, and shows off the sort of playful um, sense of that that community's culture. I think. Okay, we can move along to places to celebrate. Um, one of my favorite places, and actually Heather and I um, <laughs> enjoyed a cocktail in the outdoor cocktail garden a couple of weeks ago, um, is Bully Boy Distillers in Roxbury. Um, and I believe they just celebrated their 10 year anniversary, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so they have, you know, not only do they distill everything on site, so whiskey, rum, gin, vodka, uh, Amaro, pretty much every kind of, of spirit you can think of. Um, but they have uh, a tasting room. Um, they do, I think, probably now in-person classes again um, to learn how to make cocktails. So if you wanna try your hand at mixology, you can do that there. Um, one of my favorite things about uh, Bully Boy when I was researching um, to write the chapter was learning about how um, how the name, uh, you know, uh, originated. And so the distillery is owned by two brothers, um, Will and Dave Willis. And basically they, uh, their whole passion for this started uh, growing up on a working farm in Sherborne, Mass. And they discovered a hidden vault in the basement um, of the farmhouse. And along with all of this stashed liquor uh, was a plaque that was dedicated to one of the horses on the farm whose name was Bully Boy. And they found out um, in researching this that, number one, their great grandfather was good friends with Teddy Roosevelt. And then number two, the horse's name uh, came from one of Teddy Roosevelt's favorite phrases, which was bully. Um, so a synonym for extraordinary back in the day. Um, and I just, I think that's a, such a, a great and interesting kind of story that, that really traces back to their roots. Um, and they've kind of built the, the distillery from the ground up and it's a great place to visit. Um, I think in answer, I sort of saw it flash through the, the um, chat, but um, to, we'll get to this later, I think, but to the question of um, sort of what kinds, what our limits were, criteria were for including things in the book. I, I'm going to read to you about Fat Baby, which is a place to celebrate, um, and it's chapter 40, and I'll tell you that we included, I'll tell you why we included it in the book after I read it, and that might help you think about the kinds of choices we were making when we were choosing our um, places, our 111 places. So um, chapter 40, Fat Baby, and the cutest crapper award goes to Fat Baby, a hip sushi bar and cocktail lounge in South Boston, also has one of the cutest bathroom concepts ever, Fat Babies. 
It's like the internet in there nine months after a blizzard. Every employee's chubby cheeks have made it onto the bathroom wall, along with some cheeks belonging to a few local and visiting celebrities. Part of the charm of this nouveau pan-Asian restaurant, helmed by folks who have been cooking, bartending, and managing restaurants in South Boston and along the waterfront for a decade or more, is that it grew out of relationships with regular diners and drinkers from the neighborhood. The owner was invited by a regular at another of his South Boston restaurants, Loco, Loco Taqueria and Alston Bar oyster bar to go on a Southeast Asian trip that exposed him to a whole range of cuisine and subtle flavors he'd not had contact with before. Inspired by the trip and with tons of encouragement from regulars at his other restaurants, Fat Baby's concept became a reality just a few blocks away from Loco. Originally, Fat Baby was a code name that the team had for their space as they were building it out because it was their smallest but widest restaurant. So, you know, a fat baby. Uh, now the space is more sleek adult um, and has sort of geisha murals by a local artist named Mark Grundig, exposed brick walls and warm wood paneling. But the fat baby theme has exploded into the bathroom where hundreds of baby pictures, keep an eye out for fat baby Jay-Z among other celebrities, overwhelm you with so much cuteness that you may forget you had to pee. If it takes more than a baby filled bathroom to get you to South Boston, Consider visiting Fat Baby on one of their special dining deal days, such as Dollar Dumpling Night or Maki Mondays, or check out their social media feeds for sushi making classes. Then once you're there, grab a Fat Baby Me So Cute, as in M-I-S-O, t-shirt and head straight to the joint to the John to take infant infused selfies. And um, we included this because one of our kind of challenges from our editor was to find a special bathroom in Boston. And um, there are others, but we didn't have, we were also sort of trying to get a few more things from South Boston into the book. So Fat Baby was at this perfect intersection between Amazing Bathroom and South Boston, and their food is good too. And it's a very cool community, you know, endeavor to have brought it into the book. So we like the story too. Yeah, and that was actually, I think, um, one of the biggest kind of unexpected challenges uh, beyond just the actual writing was coming up with the list and making sure that we had a good balance of places. Um, and I think we kind of went back and forth a lot about getting the right ratio of restaurants and parks and museums um, to make sure that we were giving kind of a good overview of the city um, and highlighting you know, all these different facets of it. So um, let's see, I think, um, talk about the Liberty Hotel. I think I'll just read the chapter because this one is a cool story too. Uh, so chapter 69, Liberty Hotel, a jail gone upscale. Fortunately, the most you'll be in for is a few nights at this jailhouse turned luxury hotel. Opened in 1851 and constructed in the Boston granite style, the Charles Street Jail was a joint effort between renowned architect Ridley James Fox Bryant and Reverend Lewis Dwight. The result was a grand light-filled space with facets of Romanesque and Renaissance architecture that eschewed the bleak prison stereotype. The in inmates were also anything but typical. Malcolm X and Sacco and Vanzetti were among the famous names who got locked up here. Despite its pretty appearance, it wasn't all skylights and rainbows. A combination of overcrowding and substandard living conditions led to a revolt and declaration of constitutional rights violation in 1973 but it wasn't until the end of 1990 that the jail was fully vacated. The building was purchased by Mass General Hospital the next year, and in 2001, work to transform the property began. In 2007, the Liberty Hotel finally opened its doors to the public. Many distinctive elements of the prison remain, including the breathtaking central atrium. A cupola removed during construction in 1949 was rebuilt from scratch to be meticulously accurate to Bryant's original design. The hotel's bars and eateries bearing playful names like Alibi and Clink retained the original cells. Guests only retreat catwalk sits on the same runway where inmates once walked. And the outdoor exercise area is now a chic courtyard lounge. Even new features incorporate nods to the jail like the exposed brick and crime does not pay poster that hangs in fine dining restaurant Scampo, which is Italian for escape. And each of the 298 guest rooms combine history with luxury from the deluxe rooms to the suites with Charles River views. Don't plan on staying the night. You can still take a guided tour to dive into the Liberty's former life. 
Um, and I just, if you haven't been to the Liberty, it's great to just walk around and observe the, all of the original um, architectural elements. It's uh, actually kind of haunting to, to realize you're in a former jailhouse, but really cool as well. Is there anything else you want to talk about, Heather? Um, well, I was just thinking about, I, because I, there are two on this list here that Malcolm X had a, um, a role in, and I was that, I'm not going to read the other one, but I was um, just thinking we should tell people about the, the, the competition, <laughs> the treasure hunt, um, that there's a, a thing, a sort of special project run by the publisher that if you go to all the places in one of the books, they're sort of, you can earn other books and prizes and sort of discovering and tracing different paths through um, the 111 places in Boston. And so one challenge I offer anyone who um, does get the book or borrows it from the library is to um, see if you can find the other Malcolm X connection. <laughs> um, so, and I'm trying to think if there's anything, well, we can move on, I think, okay. unless there's something you want to hear. I think I'm good. Um, Okay, shopping. Uh, we actually, uh, I feel like we weren't super focused on places to shop necessarily um, in making the list, but we wanted to highlight, we wanted to be very intentional about the places we did highlight um, in terms of them being kind of like small, um, like independent stores. Um, so one that we actually, um, highlighted on our, we did a walking tour of JP for the book a couple of weeks ago, um, is 40 South Street. It's the first chapter in the book. Um, and it's one of my personal favorite stores. It's a co-ed uh, vintage clothing store and it has a great kind of rock and roll background. Um, the owner, uh, Hilkin Mancini, who um, both Heather and I know, she is kind of a Renaissance woman, a local musician. And she had joined forces back in the day with um, uh, one of the bartenders at the old Boston punk club, the Rat, the Rat Skeller, um, Otto Johnson, who uh, was selling uh, men's vintage clothing out of this space. And it was kind of just more of a warehouse um, type situation. And so she had just lost her record deal and was looking for ways to make money. So they teamed up, she turned it into more of a, a, a boutique that people would actually want to come in and shop in. Um, and it's been going strong ever since. So it's it's jam packed, it's a small space, but it's it's great to visit if you love vintage and secondhand items. Um, I think I'll read the chapter on Curio Spice Co. Um, it's, just, it's just a spice shop, but it's better than that. Uh, so, Curio Spice Company, a little goes a long way, it's chapter 28. Curio, Curio Spice Co. is a tiny shop that packs a wallop with the amount of flavor it has managed to stock along its small walls. It's a little bit like stepping back into the times when traders went abroad and returned with parcels from which the stories of their journeys wafted. From this particular trader, you can buy single spices like dill pollen, wild Afghan cumin, pickled cherry blossoms, and over 20 varieties of pepper. But Curio is best known for its sublime spice mixes. A favorite celebrity chef Bobby Flay, a favorite of celebrity chef Bobby Flay's is the Kozani, which features fennel, lemon peel, bee pollen, lemon verbena, oregano, sage, and Greek saffron, or the Dalat, a Vietnamese-style spice rub featuring cocoa nibs, coffee, black pepper, star anise, ginger, coriander, turmeric, and cassia from the cinnamon family. Curio stocks salts from places around the world, such as Cambodia and the Aegean Sea, and also from Martha's Vineyard in Maine, right around the corner. The salts come in sweet flavors, vanilla salt, yuzu salt, and savory, seaweed salt, truffle salt. Best of all is, is something called magic salt, which is so good that those who love it don't talk about it too much because they fear it will become too popular and not be as readily available to them. But definitely take the time to talk to folks here rather than trying to guess how, out, rather than trying to guess how to use all of this exotic stuff in your own kitchen. Curio offers recipes for applying each spice mix, books for learning more about the types of spice, spices, grinders, graters, and other tools for using fresh spices, regular sampling tasting events, and workshops for those who want to learn even more. Curio was founded by Claire Cheney as a B Corporation, a category of businesses certified as having a positive social and environmental impact through its work. So you can also rest assured that your spices were sourced in a way that was as savory as their flavor. And I, I'm 
reading this one, I think, because uh, I, I, we tried to include things for all the senses in the book. And, um, and Spice Shop is one of those places that you walk into and it's sort of a, like a, a journey for your nose too. So uh, that's, that's why I'm choosing that one today. Yeah. Um, and I think I also uh, just want to touch on Salmagundi just because it's such a unique place. If, uh, that's where the picture um, for this slide is, is from that chapter. Um, and it's an old fashioned hat shop um, even though I think they've only, they opened in maybe 2007, I believe it was. Um, but it's, you know, a haberdashery to the fullest degree. They have um, an actual workshop where they, you know, can clean and repair hats. Um, we actually learned, I believe, on the walking tour that I think they're the first um, hat store to have both women's and men's hats, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, but they have, you know, everything from bowlers to berets, um, any kind of old fashioned hat uh, you want. And the showroom's just really cool. It feels kind of like you step back into time um, and it's, you know, all very displayed very nicely as you see here. Um, and the owners, it's a husband and wife team. Um, they're super knowledgeable and really friendly um, and can kind of answer all of your hat questions and help you find the right hat for you. It's very um, like personalized service um, and kind of hearkening back to those those old school days. So it's a really great spot. Are there any others you want to talk about, Heather? Um, let's see how our time is. Yeah, we can move on, I think. Right. Um, we also have a lot of spots in the book that are, are good for a kind of day of family fun. Um, and a lot of them are not even just places to go for the day, but, you know, if you live here, um, like, I don't know if you want to talk about the Esch Circus Arts, Heather, or, um, you know, kind of more long-term spots. Yeah, I think we, we tried to think about two audiences when we were writing this. One was sort of someone coming to town who might want to get off the beaten track and see some more quirky or more, you know, nuanced parts of the city or, or find a subculture or go a little bit out of the main downtown Boston. And then we were also really thinking about like who lives here or who's moving here and may not know everything um, that is available to them that's kind of outside of the things that are advertised in the most, in the largest kind of broadcast channels. Um, and so Esch Circus Arts is one of them. It's a circus training center in Somerville, Mass. And they, they um, allow people who are sort of traveling through or in town to, to perform in circuses to use their space to kind of warm up and stay you know, in, in shape using tools that aren't available at your average gym. Um, and then they also have like circus training fitness for people of all ages and all abilities um, to try their hand at, at sort of a different kind of way of keeping your body healthy and flexible. Um, and that's something that you probably wouldn't drop in on once, but if you lived here, uh, you could start getting engaged with in a, in a long-term way. And um, it's also a great place to drop your kids off. Um, they have summer camp type programs and in the school year, um, you know, sort of like tumbling and clowning and things like that, that will help your kids burn off energy and connect with other kids in playful ways. Um, and then in terms of places you can just go for the day, um, A4 Arcade is a great spot that's, it's a partnership between um, Roxy's Grilled Cheese, which started as a food truck actually, and they have a few brick and mortars now, um, and then Area 4, um, so it's basically a, an arcade that focuses on retro video, like pinball games, um, ski ball, all of that good stuff um, that also serves grilled cheese and cocktails, um, which is kind of I feel like the best of both worlds for, for both parents and kids probably. Um, so um, it's just a really fun kind of uh, retro place to, to spend an evening or afternoon. Um, and they also host I believe, uh, like different events, um, like they have live DJ spinning, trivia nights and things like that, um, that are, are really fun for like a date night or something, which we'll also talk about. Um, and then the other one I wanted to talk about is the Lars Anderson Auto Museum, which I think is one of the coolest buildings um, in the book. It looks like a castle from the outside, 
and it was actually um, built by the uh, former city architect, I believe his name was Edmund Wheelwright. Um, I think he also constructed the um, Harvard Lampoon building, which is, is also in the book. Um, and it basically began as the personal collection of two wealthy socialites in Brookline, um, Lars and Il Isabel Anderson. And uh, they used to kind of invite people over to their house to uh, you know, look at their car collection. And they kind of went on a buying spree over a period of years where they collected all of these amazing cars. And uh, when Isabel passed away, she requested that a, a nonprofit be created. Um, and that kind of uh, was the start of the museum. And so, um, you know, you can, you can go visit and see the cars. You can um, host an event or wedding there, uh, which is a really cool kind of thing to do. And then they also have the classic car shows on the lawn. Um, I always talk about the, uh, the Transporter Fest, which I've attended, which is all the 60s and 70s Volkswagen vans and Beatles, um, which is just a really fun kind of event that they do annually there. Maybe I'll just quickly touch on the MCZ, which is the Museum of Comparative Zoology, which um, is pretty well known in Boston as also the Peabody Museum, as sort of a collection of museums that Harvard has that, that deal with um, kind of anthropology and botany and, and the natural sciences. And uh, we include it in the book, but in a different way than it's usually, it's the focus that usually is um, most promoted about the MCZ is their glass flower collection, which is gorgeous. But um, there's also another collection that's very sweet, uh, which is David Rockefeller's beetle collection. And there are hundreds and thousands of beetles, <laughs> um, which he started collecting when he was uh, a very small boy and collected um, either by himself or people started sending them to him eventually, um, really all the way up until he passed away in very late advanced age. And I just think it's a sort of beautiful testament to a person having a lifelong fascination and, and collection. I mean, a lot of kids collect bugs, but they just don't keep doing it their whole lives. And he's also someone who we think of as pretty focused on, you know, making money and, and being a, a big figure in in history and so we don't really see this other side of him so it's a nice it's also a great fun thing to bring kids to check out and then once you're there there's really three or four museums connected to one ticket so you can spend the whole day um, moving through that system um, and just a note that this this photo here um, is of martin's park which is fairly new um, and it was um, it's in honor of Martin Richard, one of the marathon bombing victims. Um, so it opened in 2019 um, and it's, it's actually right next to the Ch uh, Boston Children's Museum. So it's a great place um, you know, to have a day at the, the museum, the Hood Milk Bottle, um, and then Martin's Park, which has all of these really cool features. It has uh, kind of a modern take on the old school like tin can telephone, like talk to um, type thing. Um, it has like a, um, a, a splash pad, like a fountain um, to cool off on hot days. And it's just, there's lots of, lots of options for, for kids and a beautiful view of the water as well. Okay. Date night. So um, there are a lot of places in the book that it's, that make for an un, a kind of non-traditional and fun uh, place to go on a date. Um, I don't know if you want to start <laughs> talking about any of those. Um, I'll talk about the films at the gate because they have just um, started to reopen, which is lovely. Um, so whether, I hope you all know this, but Boston has a lot of, um, you know, outdoor films on the commons kind of programs. I don't know how active a lot of those are right now as we come back from COVID. But, um, but there, there have been some outdoor film programming. The Coach Corner does one, the Brattle does one, and then there are a few um, on the commons and through like some of the hotels in downtown Boston. But my favorite is Films at the Gate, which is in Chinatown. And there's a, if you walk through the main Chinatown gate, there's a building um, that you can see from the gate that's very, very tall and has no windows on one side. And so starting in, I think like 2013 maybe, um, there was a series being projected on that wall in the summertime, and it, it was a very kind of down-home experience. People would 
um, bring their own folding chairs from home and um, and get takeout food from the restaurants in the area and then sit in the open air and watch um, usually themes, Asian focused themes, because it's presented by the, the, the Asian Community Development Association in, in Chinatown. But um, but it was, you know, it's the kind of thing where people like talk back and yell at the screen and kids run around and um, and act out the, 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 the fight scenes in the Kung Fu movies. And um, they often will show sort of documentaries or um, independent films that won't make it to the theaters because if they're, they're particularly focused on a particular Asian audience and just there's, you know, so there's just like this, it's a, it's a real um, cultural experience with again, smell and food and people walking by and participating for a little while and then moving on. and. Just this week, they they launched a um, a, a call to have um, local performers come and do little like musical pieces before each screening. So it's it seems like it's about to become a very um, active thing again, which is great because they were quiet for a while. Um, yeah, and it's a great place to sort of just like also have a strange snack you might not normally have while watching a movie. Um, one of the ones I, speaking of places opening, um, the lily pad, thankfully, just um, just reopened, I think, a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's just a great performing arts space. It's super tiny. It's one room, um, but they host all kinds of musical performances. Um, they do a lot of jazz. Um, but they do, I, I've seen, you know, like spoken word things there. Um, and they also have an artist that comes in and does, I'm not sure how often he, he changes the mural on the wall, um, but he does these beautiful detailed murals um, that just add a really cool vibe to the space. Um, they have, I think, uh, beer, wine, and cider, um, but it's all very kind of uh, local focused and um, really highlights local artists and musicians. And it's just a really, really cool spot. Um, so I'm very happy that they, they made it through the pandemic and um, they're doing programming again. And that's in um, Inman Square in, in Cambridge. Um, and then also speaking of yelling things at uh, the screen, um, the Coolidge Corner Theater, um, one of my personal favorites also recently reopened and they've started announcing their midnight showings again. Um, and they pretty much uh, do any movie that, you know, um, encourages audience participation, like Rocky Horror Picture Show, The Room, um, Reefer Madness, I'm, I'm forgetting the other ones that, that I've seen um, them promoting, but it's definitely a fun kind of interactive experience, whether you're going with a date or friends. Um, so I would definitely check that out. <laughs> Um, I would just, I'm just going to give a little shout out to Alyssa while we're on this slide. Um, and some of the, Alyssa is our photographer, Alyssa Wood. Um, and some of the compromises and creative problem solving she did during this process. So the, the person that you're seeing here is the lead teacher and owner of um, a dance school and troupe called Capoeira Angola, which is Brazilian. Um, a Brazilian mar mar martial arts slash dance slash musical practice. And, um, you know, when we chose that as a feature, as a, as a place to feature in the book, Alyssa was planning to go um, photograph a class full of people, you know, in full gear and great music and sweating and dancing and jumping around. And um, that wasn't really possible during the pandemic. So he was still teaching his classes outdoors when the weather permitted with small, small groups. And, um, and she went, you know, out to where he lives, which is Revere. So this is Revere Beach in the background, which is beautiful, um, in the middle of the winter, and um, and got this graceful, lovely image that doesn't give you quite the feel of the going to a dance class might, but um, but really gives you a sense of the like grace and generosity of his spirit, and it's just a great photograph. So I just wanted to give her a little credit for like finding a, an elegant solution to a complicated problem. Yeah, and she, I feel like she did that a lot with a lot of different um, <laughs> chapters in the book. She was super creative in, um, you know, working around the, the various closures and um, getting in touch with, with the, you know, um, the people. I think of the, uh, the People's Karaoke is another one, um, which is a roving karaoke night that obviously 
was not happening um, during COVID. And so she got in touch with the, the host, um, uh, Sparky, his, his nickname is, um, and they arranged a shoot where he's holding the songbook and they did it outside of Charlie's Kitchen, which is one of um, the places he usually hosts karaoke. And so um, she had to get really creative and she, she came through um, in a huge way, which was great, so. Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, normally she'd be here telling you all these great stories behind yeah. these wacky photographs, but so, and I don't, I don't know them all because they come out like for the first time each time we, we have these, these book talks, but I, I just love this one. I think it's really elegant. Yeah, me too. All right, there we go. Okay, um, and while we try to keep a lot of the chapters in the book um, accessible by public transportation within the city, um, there are some that are, um, you might have to take a bus or the commuter rail, depending on where you are, um, that are, you know, a little outside of the city, but really worth visiting. Um, one of them uh, is Echo Bridge in Newton. Um, it's a masonry arch that, you, this, uh, the picture here of the, uh, on the slide, and if you stand under the bridge, um, you, like its namesake, you hear, um, I'm forgetting how many reverberations right now. Um, let me quickly look it up. Um, let's see, up to 15 um, reverberations of your voice uh, when you yell or yodel or sing. Um, and there are a lot of uh, just beautiful walking trails um, around the bridge as well. So it's just a really, really cool place to spend the afternoon. Um, I, I often talk about the Boston Cannons or you do it electronics because they're sort of things people don't know too much about. But I think today I'll read the Revere Beach chapter because we just saw it and now it's on my mind and I'm waiting for all the rain to stop so I can go to the beach. Um, and just, they announced the, uh, the Sandcastle competition. Right, right. Yeah, in August, I believe, yeah. So um, I, I'll read this chapter, and we're it's we're talking. It sort of focuses on the piping plovers, which are a, a, um, a endangered or you know at risk species that nest on Revere Beach, but other beaches around the area too. Um, but we're using that. I'm sort of using that as a lens into kind of all the migration that happens in the area or has happened in the area over time. So this is chapter 92. Revere's piping plovers, winged friends at America's oldest public beach. Revere is the oldest public beach in the United States and is a decidedly urban one. There's no way around the fact that it's on Logan Airport's flight path, but what it lacks in bucolic charms, it makes up for in liveliness and giant sun-bleached quahog, quahog, I can never say that word, quahog shells. Um, Revere is changing quickly. By the time you read this, the huge new apartment buildings overlooking Revere Beach will be finished, and there will be more joggers and strollers along Ocean Avenue than there have ever been. That's saying a lot, as Revere, named after Paul Revere, has been the first point of entry for wave after wave of immigrants since the 1620s. English settlers were followed by waves of Irish, German, and Italian immigrants, then Russian and Polish Jews flooded the city for the first few decades of the 20th century. The most recent waves are from Morocco and Brazil. Overall, the city's population is more than 25% foreign born. So it goes without saying that Revere Beach is a diverse and interesting place to plop down a towel and beach umbrella and people watch on a hot summer's day. The beach hosts a surprising number of piping plover nests. Any beach you visit along the Massachusetts coastline will have a protected area set aside for piping plover breeding, but it feels somehow especially wondrous to see these little white puffball seabirds hopping and swooping in large numbers on Revere Beach. Like Revere's many other immigrants, the tiny endangered plovers have come a long way, often as far as Mexico, without stopping, with hopes of finding a safe place to raise their families. Despite the bustle of the boulevard, the plovers fit in. They've been coming for a long time, and when you see these little puffs perched up in the rafters of Revere Beach's antique shade shelters, it's too easy to just hope they'll thrive here. Um, and then, as as uh, Kim just said, we every chapter has like a main entry, and then we have a little like aside of something that's either nearby or to check out, especially. Um, and one of the special things that happens uh, it used to be in mid July, but it looks like it's going to be in August this year is a multi-day international sand sculpting festival and people come from all over the world to sculpt sand castles competitively and usually i'm sure it will be different this year but usually over a million people to come to come to cheer them on from the sidelines so if you want to see some out of these world sand castles on revere beach look out for the 
in International Sand Sculpting Festival, uh, internationalsandsculptingfestival.com sometime in August. Yeah, I believe it's the first weekend. I'm not 100%, but I, I think it's the first weekend. So I'm hoping to go for the, I've actually never been and I really <laughs> want to go. So um, is there anything else you want to highlight or move on? Okay. Okay, and while 111 is a lot of places, uh, there were inevitably spots that we wanted to include and for whatever reason we um, we couldn't. Um, and a lot of it was, you know, with the pandemic, things were either closing under construction and not sure when, you know, they would be open again. Um, so there were a lot of moving parts to, to deal with. But um, for me personally, uh, Norman B. Leventhal Park, um, which is in the financial district, uh, was, uh, I really was kind of sad that, uh, I think we had too many parks on the list already and, and couldn't include it, but it's really um, an oasis in the middle of the city. And when I worked downtown, I would go there frequently. There's a beautiful, um, it's actually the, the picture here, um, there's a beautiful fountain, as you can see, and then there's a, a covered trellis with benches that are perfect for eating your lunch. Um, there's a nice lawn that they have. Um, I think they have like bean bags that you can kind of sit on. Um, they have like a little little free library. It's just really idyllic and um, I love it there. So maybe in the next um, the next version of the book, we can include it. But yeah, I have a, I had to get rid of a park too because we had too many parks and um, which is on this list. But um, I'll I'll give a little shout out to Shevu, um, which is uh, first of all we were trying to get people out to other parts of the city. So the Shevu is in Dorchester. I'm sad that we lost that you know excursion for people. But it's a roller rink. It's been around I'm pretty sure since the 80s, and they have like been it's been really really active in a sort of like disco not in a competitive rollerblading kind of way but in a, a roller derby kind of way but in a um you know musical like since the 70s disco feel um and uh I, they've only been around since the 80s though and uh i just looked to see if they had reopened because i was kind of hoping they had and they still haven't but what they have done is sort of have they've started a kind of pop-up kitchen there and they're serving what sounds like incredible um, you know, to go soul food, including um, like chicken and waffles, ribs, and like something called a tornado slushy. And I've never had this, but I might have to go get it fried Oreos, which mm. sounds amazing. So that's what they're doing for now until they can reopen. Um, and one other one that um, we just weren't sure if they were going to uh, make it through the pandemic was Havana Club in um, Central Square in Cambridge, which I believe they're reopen. Um, they've reopened now, but it's a salsa club um, that also does um, lessons. So you can kind of go for an all in one uh, lesson and then a dance party following that. Um, and so it's, uh, I have not been, but I would really like to go now that they're reopened. So. Well, it looks like we've got some questions. I mean, I'm happy to talk about all the things we couldn't put in the book, but um, maybe we should we should um, take some of the things that sure. you're throwing in there. Sure. All right, uh, excellent. So first of all, Kim and Heather, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, greatly appreciated. Uh, something I neglected to do at the very beginning of the presentation, and I meant to. Um, so folks still with us, there's about uh, 80 to 100 of folks uh, here with us still. Uh, let us know in the chat, where is, what is your favorite place to visit in Boston? I, 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 that was supposed to be the icebreaker question and I completely blanked. So let us know in the chat uh, where your favorite place in Boston is to visit, whether it's uh, well known or off the beaten path, uh, so to speak. And uh, that might generate some conversation as well. All right, so let's get to some questions. I did answer a few questions um, uh, uh, that I actually knew the answers to uh, based on doing some research, but uh, let's get to some good ones here. Uh, and let's circle back to Kathy's question at the very beginning, which you sort of touched on, but let's sort of flesh that out. Uh, what, were your what were your requirements for the spots to celebrate uh, to make it into the book? Uh, Boston has lots of bars, for example. Yeah, so that was actually, we kind of came up with that theme for the for the presentation. Um, 
So we didn't have a specific requirement for, for that kind of thing necessarily, but, um, and actually our editor, um, I think at one point we had too many bars and restaurants um, because both uh, Heather and I are very into, <laughs> into food and drink type spots. Um, and Boston has so many good ones. Um, but I think we actually had to uh, cut down quite a few unless they were super, super unique um, or kind of take a different angle. Like for example, um, that baby that Heather mentioned, um, which is a restaurant, but the draw was the, the kind of weird bathroom with the baby pictures. So there had to be something super compelling about it um, to include. Great. Um, so uh, Deborah says, very fascinating spots. Love your research and personal insights. Uh, in terms of places to visit, Teresa enjoys Deer Island with its great views. Uh, Rose uh, enjoys the Charles River Walk. Cheryl mentions the Appeals Court in Government Center. They uh, redid the old courthouse and it's beautiful there. There's a self-guided museum there as well uh, with some uh, pretty easy to follow signage. Renee uh, likes the Women's Educational and Industrial Union on uh, Boylston Street in Boston. It has unique and wonderful gifts. And Kathy says she doesn't have a favorite yet. She's a military spouse who's new to the area, looking for places to visit. Uh, this is awesome. None of these places came up during my searches for activities. I'm excited to visit these locations. Thank you so much. Well, Kathy, that just made my night. So let's, I'm gonna save Thank that. Talk. Uh, Margot says that she loves uh, Scarlett O'Hara's house, house in quotations. Uh, so circling back here to the questions, Kathy says, uh, this is specific to the, um, the uh, Lars Museum um, that came up a few slides ago. If it was stated at Isabel's request, what, I'm sorry, if it was started at Isabel's request, why is it called the Lars Museum instead of the Isabel Anderson Museum? That is a fantastic question and I do not have the answer, but I, I will uh, try to find out. That is that is a good point. Um, Sounds like some lobbying might be on or in order, actually. <laughs> I think so. And I'm wondering, yeah, because I'm not, I, I'm forgetting right now how old the museum is, but it's been around for a while. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's some kind of, you know, uh, old school thinking there with the naming, but um, that's a great question. I will look into that. Uh, we have a, a question from someone who is not sure the chocolate bar at the Langham is still Active. It's not. It's not. That's why it's on our list of things we wanted to include but couldn't. When we were working on the first draft of the book, they were not sure whether it would reopen or not after their renovations, and then it became clearer and clearer that it would not. So yeah, it's, that's why it's on our sad list. And that sort of ties into our next question from Sarah, who wants to know, it was mentioned that much of the research and writing was done during the pandemic lockdown. Were you concerned that any of the selections, especially the small shops or restaurants uh, for the book would close down before your book was published? Yeah, we were deeply concerned. Very concerned. <laughs> and, and, um, and a, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it was just, uh, you know, with a book it, you work on such a pretty like long timeline. Um, I think we went to print, what was it? Uh, February, I think, um, for a May publication. And so um, I think we got to, I think there's only one or two, you know, places that have, um, that aren't, aren't there that are tips or something. Um, but so we were really up until the last minute, double checking and triple checking that these, these places were, were going to be open, um, which kind of also involves some Kind of uncomfortable, uh, you know, conversations with the the businesses to to say, you know, we're we're hoping to publish you in this book. Like, is is that a safe, a pretty safe bet? So yeah, yeah. it was really heartbreaking. I mean, I think yeah. there were some some folks. I mean, in some cases, things did reopen, but we just they just couldn't confirm a date. You know, when we were when we had to confirm a date, and then um, and then as Kim said, none of our places, places like the main entries have gone away. But even since February, I would say two to three of our like sidebar tips, like while you're here, go check out this are, are not valid anymore. And that's also pretty heartbreaking that even in that short time, things could change so much. Mm -hmm. uh, some more uh, viewer recommendations. Teresa likes the Boston Harbor Islands. Uh, mm -hmm. DL likes the Ether Dome at Mass General Hospital. Uh, Michelle likes the Quarry Hill Outlook in Brookline. It's a hill and you can see uh, for miles from the top. Thank you, Michelle. Um, 
Uh, Michelle also, or a different Michelle says the Rose Garden on the Fenway. Excellent. Yep, some uh, of these are in the book. You'll yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Karen, uh, Karen, who, by the way, the Tewksbury Library hosted a program on the tombs of all the presidents uh, back about a year ago. Uh, I'll try to see if I can find the Zoom video for that one. Um, she says, um, in my humble opinion, the best off the beaten path uh, location are the tombs of presidents John Adams and John Quincy Adams and their wives, Abigail Adams and Louisa Catherine Adams. They're in a family crypt beneath the United First Parish Church in Quincy. Oh boy. That's actually sort of in our, not quite their tombs, but the um, uh, Dorothy Adams? No, what's, I just missed her first name. But um, right. her house is, is a tip in our book. That's as close as we got. <laughs> uh, Matt recommends the gallery, uh, galley diner in Southie. Wayne likes the observation deck on the custom house. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen had a question. She has a recommendation and wasn't sure if it made your book. Uh, did the Mary Baker Edie Libraries Mapaparium, probably mispronouncing <laughs> that word, uh, did that make your list? It's a 3D, world famous, three story stained glass globe that a, lost, uh, that a lot of Bostonians uh, just don't know about. Yep, it's in there. <laughs> oh, great. And uh, <laughs> including its echo effect. Wonderful. All right, Karen. And then um, uh, you, uh, on one of your slides, um, you had a bullet there on Trace uh, Gatos, uh, and Teresa was wondering if you could touch on that for a moment. So you want to take that, Kim? Yeah, so that's in Jamaica Plain. It's actually a tapas bar, and com it's combination tapas bar and then bookstore and record store in the back. Um, it's a very cool place, uh, very small and intimate. Um, but the food is great. And then after or while you're after you eat or while you're waiting for a table, if it's busy, um, you can go browse the books and, and records. Um, so it's it's a great little spot in JP. And they sometimes have live music. I see this um, question here. Uh, it's they don't have room for a piano, although I think I've seen keyboards in there, but they do have often like someone playing bass or cello, like sort of a simple like small trio or smaller um jazz jazz stuff there um piano bars that's a there good used question. to be one jacob worth i think it has closed that was in the, it was um kind of near the theater district um i don't believe it's there anymore but yeah. there was one in brookline too that's also now gone yeah. uh that's a good question for our research our research team which yeah. is us <laughs> <laughs> um i do like a good piano bar uh I don't know if they still nah, there's they're they're not they're not doing anything right now. There's there there were a few opportunities to piano bar it up in Boston that I, I I'm pretty sure are gone. So all right. Well I think uh, so first of all, you've I, uh, the idea of having a, a bookstore and a record store uh, inside a restaurant or uh, oh my gosh, you just blew my mind right there. <laughs> uh, cer certainly have have gone to bookstores that have cafes in them. But to have a have a restaurant, a full fledged restaurant with a with a record store and a bookstore, that's something I need to check out. Um, so I think uh, it's eight. It's a little bit past eight o'clock. We oh wait a second. Did somebody sneak something in there? Uh, hey. Jack notes that Jake <laughs> Worthis's is closed. Uh, the building yeah. is for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. But I did just I, I thought I wanted to check before I said anything. But there's Howl at the Moon, which. I've never been to, I know it's like a more chain type place, but they do have dueling piano shows there. <laughs> and that's, um, I think it's near this, uh, it's in the financial district area, I believe. Um, so they do have a piano bar scene there, I guess, Howl at the Moon, but. Yeah, and I saw that the lily pad um, on July 15th, which is like tomorrow or yeah. Um, has Jimmy Tingle, I don't know if any of you all know him, he's kind of a Boston institution um, performer, uh, pol political satirist, and piano player. So um, you could at least see him play the Lily Pad's beautiful grand piano, baby grand piano, um, and make fun of politics tomorrow you if you go. wanted. <laughs> uh, Sarah also recommends Hollow at the Moon. And uh, so there you go, Kathy, you can check that out. Excellent. Great. All right. Well, we've addressed all questions and comments. We've gone the full hour. Um, Kim and Heather, thank you so much. Do you have any last words for the for the audience before we wrap it up? Thank you, everyone, for yeah. joining us. This is really fun. Yeah. Enjoy our city.
Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Look for that email from me tomorrow morning with a link to this recording and a link to a feedback survey. And uh, I hope, I again, want to thank uh, Andover, North Reading, and Wilmington uh, for partnering with the Tewksbury Library tonight. Also want to thank the Corning Foundation and Corning Life Sciences here in Tewksbury uh, who are sponsoring our uh, author series on Wednesday nights this summer. And um, yeah, so that'll just about do it. Uh, thank you, Rose. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Heather. And thank you to the other 100 or so people who attended. I hope everyone has a great night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you.